Good evening and welcome to our annual event chaired by Royal Society of Literature Fellow Edmund Gordon, exploring the varied working lives of those in the literature sector and how to get started in your own career in words. I'm Molly Rosenberg, I'm Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and during this 90 minute webinar, each panellist will speak about their own work, followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions to people who have been there and done it via the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. This year, we will hear from a renowned literary agent, a literature officer at Creative Scotland, a T.S. Eliot prize winning poet and professor of creative writing, and the programme manager from Manchester Poetry Library. We hope their journeys will inspire you as you embark on your own career in literature. We are so pleased to welcome nearly 800 of you this evening, which is the greatest number we've ever had for a careers in literature talk. Please let us know when you're, where you're joining from uh, via the chat box, which is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We know that lots of you are joining from King's College London tonight. Oh, hello, we've got someone from Essex already. Um, so lots of you are joining from King's College London, as well as Leeds, Essex, Edinburgh Napier, Manchester Met, Aberystwyth, Newcastle, Warwick, and as far away as Stanford in California and Princeton in New Jersey. You've each received, I hope, an email uh, inviting you to attend another of our online events for free. Uh, the RSL runs nearly 30 events um, a year, which you can join us for. Uh, the, the event that we're inviting you to next week is RSL Remembers K Dick next Tuesday at 7 p.m. via the British Library Player. If you'd like to attend, please just email info at rsliterature.org and we'll sign you up and we'll keep posting that into the chat. Uh, through the course of this evening, so you can join us then. Thank you uh, to our partners at King's College London for their support for this evening, particularly James Grand, who has helped organise tonight's event, and to the RSL's events and outreach manager, Beth Gallimore. Now, to introduce our chair for tonight. Edmund Gordon is the author of The Invention of Angela Carter, which won a Somerset Maugham Award the Slightly Fox Best First Biography Prize and an RSL Jerwood Award, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. His essays and reviews have appeared in a wide variety of publications, including the Financial Times, The Guardian, The Independent and The New Statesman. He teaches literature and creative writing at King's College London and is a regular contributor to the Sunday Times, TLS and the London Review of Books. Over to you, Edmund. Thank you very much, Molly, and uh, welcome to all of you. Um, as Molly indicated, we've got a really brilliant and varied uh, panel of speakers tonight who between them uh, range across the worlds of poetry and fiction writing, agenting, editing, teaching, events programming, and more. Uh, I'm just gonna say a little bit about how this evening's gonna work. I think each of the panelists is going to speak for a few minutes uh, about their own careers and their own working lives. And then we'll open it up for a wider discussion for half an hour or so, and then there'll be a chance for you in the audience to ask questions. And if you have questions, please, I can see someone has already done so, uh, just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom there. So first up is Martin Kratz. Martin is Programme Manager at the Manchester Poetry Library at Manchester Metropolitan University. His work includes developing their collection through events programming, and he's particularly passionate about their collection of poetry in Manchester's community languages and poetry in recording. After completing his MA and PhD in creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan, Martin worked on Manchester's successful bid to become a UNESCO City of Literature. He was co-editor of Penned in the Margins, Mount London, and is the author of the poetry pamphlet, A Skeleton's Progress. His translations of the poetry of Nellie Sachs and Yusuf Naum appeared in The Heart of a Stranger, an anthology of exile literature. Thank you, Martin, over to you. Thank you, Edmund, and thank you, Molly. Thank you both for the kind introductions and also for the invitation. Um, it means I spent the last week or so carefully thinking about my um, career in words, as it was put in the blurb, um, which I really liked. Um, and I think actually career in words is a lot more accurate than a career in the literature sector Arguably, I've never been in the literature sector and I've been employed by the education sector uh, most for most of my career. But I think that shows a little bit about how um, how these things work. Um, 
I'm going to, I'm keeping a careful eye on the time. I've practiced this a few times, gone through it and tried to think about what's the most valuable thing to say. And to start with, I'm, it still may just be a series of incomplete thoughts, um, but I hope they're helpful. Um, the one thing I'll note, and this is a relatively recent incomplete thought, it's really the response is idea of the varied careers you can have in the literature sector is that my own career is really, I mean, varied doesn't really come into it. It's all over the shop. And nothing I did seem to have anything to do with the next thing, but all of it has come together into something um, coherent now, and perhaps it always made sense. But I guess um, I was hoping to say that as a kind of form of encouragement, which was that I never could have predicted what I was going to do because I didn't know it existed and each small step led to something else. So passion for writing and reading is kind of the first thing though and that's always been there and that's driven that and everything I've done has been connected to that and it sort of comes together in what I do now. So um, how did I get where I am and why um, and, and what do I even do? Um, well uh, kind of passion for, for, for literature led me to do an English degree uh, which got me into teaching and then I did an MA in creative writing to get me out of teaching um, and um, that was in poetry. Um, when I went on to do the PhD though, I didn't do it in creative writing, I did it in something critical and, and as you can see there's a lot of kind of to and fro. Um, while I did the PhD um, I edited a book, I did some writing and it was I think I did a residency somewhere as well as a writer. So there are all kinds of little things which were slowly adding up, but I couldn't see that at the time. I think I need to stress. Um, then I was lecturing and then I did a cultural engagement fellowship at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation in Manchester. And I think that's my first kind of, um, really that's where I guess I'm in, I'm my first sort of job in the literature sector. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation hosts a vast archive of the works of the author Anthony Burgess, who's the author of Clockwork Orange, who's from Manchester. And the work involved research and a lot of thinking about writing, which really is probably the thing I love the most. Um, but I also curated my first exhibition. I did podcasts on the material. I did uh, blogs. I was writing about it in a different way, ways I hadn't done before. Um, and that really was, that kind of was a sort of turning point for me. Um, I really loved doing that work. Um, uh, I liked the, the events, creating the events and how it all kind of fit together. And that for me um, really was an important moment. The, after that, I continued similar work as a job, which sounds up like a made up job title, but really this was my job title, which was Poetry Projects Manager. And it really meant that at my work, this was for Manchester Metropolitan University, that any poetry late, related projects which weren't linked to courses kind of fell onto my desk. And they included everything from writing online courses um, to the um, bid for Manchester to become a UNESCO city of literature. And this was another kind of transformative moment. Um, I didn't really know that things like this existed, but effectively I was doing a consultation with my colleague Kate Feld, um, trying to get a kind of snapshot of what, um, of what the kind of the literature sector in Manchester was at the time. Um, and if there's time at the, when I've kind of finished this, but I'll kind of, I might talk about that one a bit more because that one really was for me a kind of changing point. The, um, the key thing I want to say at this point uh, is that you can see that none of this had anything to do with my PhD, really. Uh, some of it might have had something to do with my MA and that it was poetry, but actually it was kind of much bigger than that. And the UNESCO consultation really, I, I spoke to so many different people, it was kind of a really sort of formative thing for me in terms of how literature interacts. And actually rather than literature sector, we found ourselves pretty soon talking about the literary literary ecology of Manchester because it felt much more like that. It felt like an organism that kind of, the way it interacted, the way it grew, the way things, I don't know, like I'm making it sound like a kind of thicket of things, but maybe that is what it's like. Um, so then one day the project that landed on my desk as project manager was the Manchester Poetry Library. And really that was the project to subsume all other projects. Um, it's been an amazing uh, opportunity and, and really who could have, you know, which kind of school career consultant could have told me that's what I would have ended up doing. Um, my job there was 
the Manchester Met had already decided to kind of to build a poetry library. Um, but a lot of the things that I was involved with was um, the, the architecture of the collection, what would be in there um, and the program. And also what's really important to me is how they interact with each other, that they're not separate things. And as far as possible, we've tried to design a kind of program where what's on the shelves and what's, you know, that it's kind of linked to the things we do as well. Um, uh, and I thought I'd sort of wrap up by just giving you a kind of um, idea of uh, what I do from day to day. So my job as poetry projects manager stopped in September because the poetry library opened and that project was done. And then you can't be a project manager anymore. So now I'm the program manager and effectively that work is carried on. Um, and we opened September to the public. Uh, we're in the heart of Manchester. Um, and so what have I been working on? So currently I'm working on an exhibition. Again, I do like exhibitions, um, even though that's, again, I had no background in that. I, you, I just sort of stumbled into that um, of poetry on vinyl, which was curated for us. Our collection was curated for us by the poet Anthony Joseph. Um, and he had the idea of kind of putting them up on walls and doing something like that to get attention to it. So this is again, is how the program and the collection interact because um, we do events to kind of draw attention to what's in there. Um, last week, uh, we hosted an event, Why I Write Poetry with Nine Arches Press. So working with presses and again, that was uh, a kind of week for me of thinking about that question, why I write poetry, uh, in order so I was prepared, so I could ask questions of the of the poets who I was who I was going to speak to, um, and I'm thinking ahead to the next events, which will be ce celebrating International Mother Language Day, which is a UNESCO event, which is linked to the UNESCO Cities of Literature. I guess finally, the thing I really love doing is just being in a space and seeing writers um, and readers using it, um, and I guess to to sum it up. What I do now and what I really love doing is kind of creating spaces for people to read and write literature. Um, and for myself, where my own writing and reading fits in, it's generally if I get the train home, I can write. And if I'm driving home, I can listen to an audiobook, And that's basically where they fit. Um, but uh, again, that's how they feed off each other. So and I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, you. you you make your career path sound very serendipitous, like you've effectively you almost drifted into these quite specialised sounding roles sometimes. And I think what might strike um, many people in the audience is that you don't seem to have done specific training for them. Is that the case? I mean, you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, um, I haven't done specific training for them um, quite, I mean, I've spent so much time with librarians over the last two years. Sometimes I forget I'm not one. Um, that's another job I haven't had. I'm not a librarian yet. I work in a poetry library. Um, I haven't got training exhibitions. But I sort of, some of them I learned as I go. But actually, for instance, and, and this for me is one of the huge pleasures of the job, is that actually I work with, really a lot of what I do is work with experts in those areas. So for the exhibition for the vinyl, for instance, I'm working with the team at Manchester Met who will do the installation. I work with the designers, I work with the poets, and, and that's how that conversation goes. Um, and, and sort of, yeah, it just sort of becomes about coordinating kind of everyone else, um, or maybe not, or just being in conversation with everyone else rather than coordinating. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Sinead Morrissey. Sinead is the author of six poetry collections and was appointed Belfast's inaugural Poet Laureate. Her accolades include first prize in the UK National Poetry Competition, a Lannan Literary Fellowship and the E.M. Forster Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her collections Through the Square Window and Parallax both received the Irish Times Poetry Prize. Sinead won the T.S. Eliot Prize in 2013 and the Forward Prize for Best Collection in 2017. In 2020, she received the European Poet of Freedom Award for her collection On Balance, translated into Polish by Magdalena Heidel. She is currently Professor of Creative Writing at Newcastle University. Sinead. Thank you so much, and thank you, Royal Society of Literature, for the invitation to come and be part of the panel this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to just make five brief points in, in these opening remarks. Um, 
And the first thing I'd like to say, which is a really obvious point, but it's quite easily overlooked. And that's if you want to be a writer, you have to write. So in a sense, I feel I was really lucky in that I knew I wanted to be a writer really early on. I knew I wanted to write poetry specifically really early on, ever since I first encountered it in primary school. So as a child, poems like Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost, or um, I remember uh, first hearing The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, just the first opening stanzas of that and being completely like transfixed and hooked and, and just wanting to know more. So when I first heard poetry, it had a kind of visceral effect on my nervous system. Um, and I don't, I don't think I understood it intellectually. I don't think I needed to, but I do think I experienced it as a kind of form of magic or a spell. Um, so by the age of about 10, I was already, I was already writing poetry all the time. And um, I was really clear that that's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I think there are so many other activities associated with being a writer, and this is more the case now than ever before, such as talking about being a writer, which I'm doing tonight, um, or reading or speaking at events, um, maintaining a social media presence, which I don't actually do, but I know many, many people do, um, teaching and so on. And all of these are, you know, they're, they can feed into your work and they're really valuable and interesting in and of themselves. Many of these activities are, are a privilege and a pleasure to undertake. But it is easy in the midst of all of that, I think, to forget the core primary activity. So um, it's worth reiterating right at the start, if you want to be a writer, you have to write. And you need to write a lot, particularly at the start. And I think you need to do this for a couple of reasons. And um, the first of these is that writing isn't something you can learn in your head independently of actually doing it. And in this sense, I think it's a very hands-on practical skill like cooking or learning to drive a car. And nothing is more instructive than making mistakes. So you also need to read a lot too. Writing and reading, I think, are symbiotic activities. They depend on each other. They mutually enrich each other. They're in a dynamic relationship to each other. Um, so read everything you can get your hands on. Read very different kinds of things too by a wide range of writers and in different styles and genres from what you're primarily interested in. I would say copy stuff. I would say set yourself exercises. If you're very lucky, you'll feel inspired, but you won't feel inspired all the time. And um, in my own personal experience, I was inspired much more when I was young. <laughs> and as I grew older, <laughs> inspiration kind of seeped away. And uh, sort of in the middle of my 20s, I realized that just, you know, hanging around waiting for the next poem to strike wasn't an effective writing strategy for me anymore. So I had to kind of get on regardless. Um, and that was that was in and of itself a real kind of learning curve. And I had to adjust lots of things. Um, I think the second reason you need to write a lot is that so you actually have words on the page to show to other people. Um, these might be teachers or mentors at first, but later on, you'll need to show words on the page to other people too. Editors of journals or websites, agents or publishers, all the gatekeepers to being a published writer. The gatekeepers to a career as a writer, and that's, that's primarily the focus of, of of my talk tonight is, you know, very straightforward writing being published. I think writing is really, really hard, as well as being exciting and enriching. I think it's incredibly difficult, at least I think it's incredibly difficult. And I'm in a kind of tortuous relationship to it. I think a lot of writers are. So when I don't write for long periods of time, I feel extremely frustrated, stressed and unhappy. But at the same time, if I do have time, I will find myself avoiding it too. So it takes an act of will for me to sit down and make myself write. But if I'm not actually writing, doing all the other stuff just makes me feel fraudulent. 
It's easy to look back and see really clear milestones on my path to a career in poetry. Moments where you come out of your own room, out of your own head in a sense, and start to engage with an objective readership. I wrote all the way through my teens, um, and I entered a lot of writing competitions too. Winning or even being placed on these can offer a terrific sense of external vindication. I started to send out individual poems to poetry magazines and journals when I was still at university in my early 20s. And I had an incredibly lucky break when I was 22. I'd sent some poems off to PN Review, the poetry magazine connected to Carkinet Press, again in Manchester. And after accepting some poems for the magazine, Michael Schmidt asked me if I had a collection, if he'd be interested in publishing it. It took another year of work and when it was published, it still wasn't very good, though I did not know that at the time, but it was the start I needed. I've published six collections of poetry now, all with Carkinet Press, and I think I'm really lucky to have had such a long-standing relationship with an independent publisher and with my editor. I think it's a loyalty that in my case definitely pays both ways. I've been lucky, and serendipity was mentioned there just at the end of the last talk. Um, I've been lucky in countless other ways too. So I've won prizes, for example, and the books and the prizes together have led directly into a career as a creative writing teacher at university. So um, after the publication of my second collection, Between Here and There, um, I got a job in Queen's University in Belfast as a writer in residence, which was just a three year post. Um, but, you know, it, it was it was fabulous. I had to run a creative writing workshop. I had never been in a creative writing workshop and um, I'd never taken a course in creative writing and I didn't know anything about teaching creative writing. I didn't know you could. And um, so, you know, that, that those three years as writer in residence at Queen's were, were really foundational in, in me getting to grips with the kind of teaching of creative writing um, as, well as, as well as the writing of it. And after that, I went on to be a lecturer and I, you know, I was at Queen's for many years and I recently moved to um, Newcastle University where I've continued in the creative writing department. Um, and I think in lots of ways, teaching creative writing in university is a really good fit for me. I really enjoy the teaching um, and I get a lot of inspiration from my students. You know, you're surrounded by brilliant writers when you're in a job like mine. Um, but it, it and it's I think the challenge is is what I started with the challenges within all of those kinds of activities to maintain a space where you can do your own work um, and a colleague from Belfast once said to me Glenn Patterson the novelist once said to me it's not just that you need time you need to write you need consecutive time and you need the right kind of consecutive time um, and I think that's very true I write on a Friday if I've been doing lots of other things during the week so I tend to write when I get these breaks from university and I think we're still incredibly fortunate in the university that study leave and periods of time away are still inbuilt to are still you know inbuilt in the infrastructure of teaching in universities. So I tend to write my books now when I'm away from the university. So in a sense, all the milestones on my road to a career in next year, the publication, the prizes, the teaching. In a sense, and this is a kind of irony at the heart of my presence tonight on a, on a uh, you know, careers in literature panel. In a sense, I think a lot of that has been out of my control um, and a matter of incredible good fortune. Um, you do need to put yourself forward for all the opportunities that come your way. You aren't probably going to be randomly discovered and you do have active control over this process. It's hard, rejection is often at the heart of it, but you do need to keep going. But the part you have the most control over, the most agency, is the writing itself. Making sure you have enough of it when you need it, making sure it's good enough. All writing journeys, all creative literature start here. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Idud. Uh, you know, that was inspiring. Um, I, I wonder you mentioned the prizes and their importance to you, um, to your career. Um, and I was just wondering about at an early stage. I mean, you you seem to have found an editor fairly early on in your uh, writing life. Well, actually, you were writing as a teenager, but in your professional yeah. life. Um, yeah. I was just wondering. I mean, smaller prizes for poets who are just starting out who haven't yet published a book, perhaps don't have a huge body of work. Are they equally important, you think? In getting oh, they're probably more important. I think they're probably more important, you know. Um, I think, it, you know, those first kind of, yeah, those instances where someone else has read something that you've written, who's maybe not your mom or your dad, um, and, and just um, put a value on that. That's what's so transformative. And, you know, that often does happen very long with the minor prizes like, I was encouraged when I was in school to enter something called the Irish Schools Creative Writing Awards, which was North and South Ireland. It was for people um, who were in school. And I never won. I never won that. But I entered every year and I would get placed. You know, I would get like highly commended or commended or, you know, I was always like it was always kind of the tail end of, of a long line of people who were noticed through that. But that they were probably the most, you know, transformative kind of things I ever won because it just felt like I was in the room, you know. I remember going, first time I got commended or something in this, and there was a room, we, I was invited to a workshop in Dublin with this poet, and there was this room of all these other kids. And I just remember sitting there, you know, it was like, right, this is it. I'm a right, I was thinking it was 12 or 13 I was like right this is it I'm a writer and John F. Dean the poet was running it and he said to us all you've all got talent right every day and it was like you know it was just you're open and you're vulnerable and you're ready to be told things and you're so hungry to be told things and and that just went right in and I've never forgotten it. Thank you thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Emma Patterson. Emma joined literary agency Aitken Alexander Associates in 2018 after eight years at Rogers Coleridge and White and the Wiley Agency. Emma became a member of the Booker Prize Foundation as advisory committee and was made a director of Aitken Alexander in 2020. She was recently included in Vogue's list of 25 influential women shaping 2021 and beyond. Welcome, Emma. Hi, Edmund. Um, uh, thank you for having me and. Um... Thank you for the invitation. Um, I suppose I'll just start by sort of going through, well, like others, going through um, my journey from more or less 2010 when I started in agenting to now. Um, I, except the first thing to say is that um, before I began in agenting, um, I I was always quite focused on a career in words, but actually initially had tried to become a film critic um, and uh, had done that freelance for a number of years after graduating. Um, and, um, and it was incredibly difficult. It was very, very difficult um, to sustain that as, as a proper career. Um, and so I turned to, to publishing and, um, and I started actually in academic publishing. So I've gone on as, as it's, it's more or less a traditional route, but with some kind of, um, some strange turns along the way. Um, but I started in academic publishing and um, I soon realized that I actually wanted to work in, in fiction editorial. Um, I found it incredibly difficult to break into that world, which um, now I look back, I realise um, is, is, is a very closed one, remains quite a closed one, is slightly more open now than it was in, this would have been in 20, uh, 2009 or 2010, um, but was very, very difficult to break into, I found. Um, and so I discovered um, by chance um, a job called uh, an, an agent's assistant and I had very little idea what uh, a literary agent did. I had a kind of a vague sense that it was a bit like a manager, a band manager, someone who worked in music but who represented um, authors instead of, instead of musicians. Um, but the job was with 
a, a, a very esteemed agency um, called the Wiley Agency, and the, the client list was was incredibly impressive and compelling. Um, and so I applied. I applied for that job, and I didn't actually get it the first time. I was encouraged at the end of that to. Um, to, to apply again, um, which three months later I did do. And uh, at that point I was successful. Um, and I worked there for just under three years um, and learned a huge amount in a relatively short space of time. And I think part of that was because um, although I worked in the London office, there was also an office in New York and the two offices were incredibly connected. And so, in, in quite a short stretch of time, um, I think I, I was given a really strong global understanding of, of what an agent does um, and a, a kind of a, a close up understanding of how to um, represent and manage an author's career in, in a truly 360 way. Um, and that to me has always marked out uh, quite a key difference between working as an editor of, of, of a book in a publishing house and working as an agent in an agency um, is that as an agent, you're, you're required to think about um, the entirety of a career um, and uh, rather than thinking book by book. And you're also not just thinking about the domestic market um, you're you're often thinking about the entire world um, and that for me was incredibly exciting I really liked the access to the North American market in particular um, and so I think I carried I carried that with me into the next agency that I that I worked at um, which was Rogers Coleridge and White um, where I became an assistant to um, the managing director, Peter Strauss, who became a really important mentor for me. And I suppose maybe that might be something that comes up um, over the course of, of the evening is, is the importance of, of people who, who really support you at, at formative stages of your career. Um, and, and in this case, introduce you to, to lots of people who, who later become very important contacts as, as you as you begin to do your job and you begin to kind of build your own list as an agent. Um, I was there for five years and while I was there, I progressed from assistant to agent, um, which is quite a kind of neb nebulous um, transition and takes a long time <laughs> and, um, and is very kind of, person specific and, and nuanced um, and, and probably very opaque actually to, to people outside of the industry and people at, even at, just outside of agenting. Um, uh, and after five years there, I moved to the agency that I work at now, Aiken Alexander, um, which uh, where I'm a director um, and I, um, yeah, I'm extremely, fulfilled and happy and um yeah that's that's sort of a potted history thank you very much emma there's uh, a huge amount i'd like to pick up on in what you just said but uh, the first thing um it struck me when you said that fiction editorial was a very closed world very difficult to break into mm. and do you mean i mean it sounds to me like you mean that it's a sort of nepotistic kind of enclave of privilege and <laughs> is that what you mean? And if so, is agenting very different to that? And is fiction editorial changing a lot? I think it's. I think it really is changing. Um, I mean, we've hired um, recently um, a couple of times at, at entry level, and and the way that I'm not to suggest that <laughs> it, the way we recruited can't be improved or perfected, but I think that the way that was handled to me felt like it it, uh, it it attracted and um and welcomed a number of applicants who I imagine when I was applying probably really didn't get proper consideration and certainly weren't interviewed I was never interviewed and um and and I never received any feedback um, and I found that incredibly 
difficult um, and it just meant that you were spending maybe, you know, months and months, sometimes years applying for jobs, but having no idea why you weren't kind of progressing even to, the, you know, the next step. Um, and, and then when I, when I did have a job in publishing, I realised that a lot of it was because you, you sort of had to be within the industry in order to get different jobs in the industry um, to get anywhere. So, yeah. Is agenting any better? Um, I think it is for, for various different reasons, but we can maybe get into it later. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, we, I'd like to return <laughs> to, to some of this stuff. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker is Catalina Watt. Catalina's work was longlisted for Penguin Right Now 2020 and has been published in Haunted Voices, Unspeakable and Extra Teeth, among others. In 2021, she received a writer's grant from Ladies of Horror Fiction and has appeared at festivals and literary events, including the Edinburgh International Book Festival, Sim I'm going to mispronounce these words, I apologise, Simera and Firecon. Is that right? Is that vaguely right? Chimera, but yes. Chimera, thank you. <laughs> Catalina is Literature Officer at Creative Scotland and Audio Director for Correo, a speculative fiction magazine for immigrant and diaspora authors. Welcome, Catalina. Thank you so much um, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's a real privilege to be here and to um, also pick up some pearls of wisdom from the other speakers. Um, I'm going to sort of give, a, a, I guess, a potted history of my career in literature because it's, um, it's quite varied in terms of roles and also um, it's got an international bent to it. So um, hopefully there, there are some uh, bits and bobs that people can pick up and I'm happy to kind of dive into any of the specific things that um, I talk about. So um, I started by completing a degree in English literature from the University of Glasgow. Um, and while I was there, I was also doing a creative writing undergraduate thesis, which is a little bit unusual, um, but that kind of gives you an insight into the many hats that I will <laughs> wear throughout my career. Um, and I also did a year abroad at the University of Calgary, um, and when I was doing my year abroad, I worked at the bookshop and theatre on campus, which was a really great opportunity um, to meet people and to kind of learn about the arts um, in an international context. Um, so when I graduated from university, I moved back to London, where I'm originally from, and I worked in audio publishing. So this was in 2015 when audio was, I mean, audio is still very much on the rise, but it was kind of the first massive takeoff where publishing was like, this is, this is the big thing. Um, so it was a very exciting time to be part of that. Um, and I was working for Little Brown who are part of Hachette, um, one of the, the big five publishers. Um, and this role was facilitated by Creative Access who do really, really great work in terms of diversifying the arts. So um, not only was I kind of in my role in house, but I was also given mentorship and kind of encouraged to network with people, not just at Hachette, but within the wider industry, if there were specific careers I was interested in, um, publishing was so new to me at that point, I just wanted to talk to everybody about what they did and how it kind of was all interconnected. Um, so that first role was a really great kind of holistic overview. Um, and it really made me realize I kind of come from the academic space of reading books um, and kind of talking about literature to realizing that there are people behind making books other than just the author, which I think is, it sounds very obvious, but um, I didn't really realize the, the amount of work and the amount of kind of collaboration it takes to bring a book to your bookshelf. So um, that was a really great opportunity to kind of understand that. Um, it was also the first time I encountered the Society of Young Publishers who um, do some really excellent work and they are a great organization to get involved with. Um, especially if you're kind of early in a career in books. Um, I then relocated to Vancouver in Canada um, and I worked as a bookseller at an independent children's bookshop and kind of took some time out to go traveling and to work on my own writing. Um, so that's what I did after that. And then I kind of took that time to figure out what was my next step going to be and I didn't necessarily want to return to London so um, I came back to Scotland where I had done my undergraduate degree um, to pursue a master's in publishing at Edinburgh Napier University and so while I was there I was working in events and book selling um, at a fantastic independent bookshop um, called Golden Hair Books 
Um, and that was really great because I was doing kind of events programming, meeting authors, meeting publicists. Um, and because I'd already worked in publishing and then done the masters, I had a really clear idea of the, the gaps that I wanted to fill in my knowledge. Um, and then I joined the SYP Scotland um, in, and kind of helped out with organizing their conference, which again was a really great opportunity to program speakers, meet with people um, and find out just the various things that a person can do in books. Um, so then after I completed my master's, I was offered a position at Canongate, who are a Scotland based um, independent publisher. And I was working in their audio and digital department. So I had gone full circle <laughs> and come back to audio at that point. Um, and I was working with authors um, such as Selena Gordon, Lem Sisse and Matt Haig. Um, and there's something really wonderful about kind of collaborating on an audio project because um, it's, it's, I kind of talk about it as like bottled theater. Um, and I kind of have a background in theater as well. And so just putting those two things that I love together was just such a, a wonderful experience. Um, and while I was at Kenningate, I was kind of part of the EDI committee there and started realizing there were lots of things in the sector that I wanted to change and that perhaps um, a different role out with of commercial publishing might be the best way to do it. Um, so I was selected for Literature Alliance Scotland's career development program, Next Level, which kind of involved some mentorship, some networking. Emma was very kind to give me some of her time during that program um, and some training opportunities. And, just a kind of um, a good chance to figure out what my next step would be. So at the end of that, um, kind of last year, I left Canongate to join Creative Scotland as literature officer, where I am now. Um, and this role is quite different from my previous role in kind of audio, kind of trade publishing. Um, so this role kind of involves supporting individuals and organisations, um, helping to develop the sector in a wider way um, with both kind of targeted funds and then um, something we call open fund, which is a kind of year round pot of funding where people can apply to fund specific projects um, through like an application and panel process. Um, so that's my current role. And in, in addition to that, I also, as you say, volunteer as audio director at Corio magazine. So I haven't fully left the audio world behind. Um, and I'm also an author who is long listed for the Penguin Right Now program, which as Sinead was saying, mentorship opportunities are so important um, as a writer as well as a publisher. Um, and I also chair events and lead workshops. Um, so I have multiple hats that I wear and I really enjoy all of it. So yeah, that's a very, very potted history of, of my career. Thank you. Thank you. You sound enormously busy. Um, <laughs> Can you say a bit more about the mentoring program that you mentioned? Because it's, uh, I mean, I think slightly unlike what, what Emma was mentioning earlier, I mean, that sounds like a quite a formal organised thing. I mean, other to your knowledge, many such things. And you were already, you know, launched on a career in publishing mm -hmm. at that stage. Um, so that kind of thing is, is useful, you know, having been launched. It's not just to get into a career. Yeah, definitely. I think. Um... I've been, I've had the privilege of being mentored at various stages in my career, um, either in a kind of formal context or, or in an informal way. And at Canongate, I had a mentor who was also part of the Independent Alliance. Um, so the mentorship I did through, is it the Next Level Award um, from Literature Alliance Scotland, that one, yeah. That was really great because it was, um, it was kind of an application process and Literature Alliance Scotland are very hands-on about tailoring the program to what you as an individual mentee are looking for so they kind of asked me who are like the dream people in the industry who you would love to just have a I guess a virtual coffee with and just kind of um, bounce ideas around how you want to change and improve the industry and I think starting very ambitious was a really great way of me kind of directing my focus on people who I think are like absolute superstars and are just doing such amazing work um, and who, who also are very much kind of putting the ladder down for people who are coming up behind them in terms of emerging in their own careers. Um, because I think it's, it's one skill set to be able to do a thing very well, but to be able to, to teach how to do that is another great skill set. Mm. Um, 
So I think just that specificity of what you want from a mentorship is really important because it helps the mentor as well be able to tailor how they approach that relationship with you. And I think having it be goal oriented is good because there are some relationships where you just check in every once in a while and it's more informal. But if you have a formal structure, you kind of know when you are done, you know when you've achieved what you set out to do, which I think can be really, really gratifying for both parties. Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, a formal mentorship in that sense is, is in the world of publishing is, mm. is kind of equivalent to what happens in creative writing courses. And so, well, two of you studied creative writing and Sinead, you now teach it. Um, do, do you see that as a sort of mentoring role that you play, Sinead? Yes, definitely. Um, I think it's really important to these brilliant poets kind of appear in my undergraduate modules and shine. And then, you know, they would follow through, they would go on to do like the MA in creative writing and some of them went on to do a PhD. So I would have the opportunity to work with a younger writer for a long stretch of years and to be kind of um, witness to, you know, in some cases, such an extraordinary flowering, like, Podrick Regan was one of my students, Scott McHenry was one of my students, you know, um, and it's definitely, um, it's, it's paid for through the structures of the university, but I think it can definitely be a mentor type relationship. And as, as was said, you know, that is mutually enriching, definitely. Thank you. Martin, you've, having studied creative writing, you've, you've gone to work in, in a number of things, which it's not sort of an obvious launch pad to. I mean, I think a lot of, certainly my undergraduate students here at King sometimes worry that if they do an MA in creative writing, it won't, it won't necessarily render them unemployable, but it will not maximize their employment prospects for the year in which they're doing it. But you obviously haven't found that. No, um, but also, but I also had those anxieties and they were all there and I didn't quite like, Looking back, I can piece it together quite clearly, but kind of looking at it from the other way that this wasn't an obvious, uh, it wasn't obvious to me what was going to happen. Um, I think the mentorship with the writing, I guess ultimately, you know, I really, really love and care about poetry and my thinking about poetry and what I think its value is and, and things like that has gone into everything else I've done. And it's because of that, I've, I was just kind of, um, something Sinead said, said earlier about kind of, you know, kind of taking the opportunities that are there. Um, I didn't do those so much in terms of writing. I did them in terms of everything else. I, I was kind of, you know, I joined in with kind of people who were producing events and, and, and actually my, the mentor I think of most clearly, I guess, who probably set me off in this path is, is, was the poet Linda Chase. And it wasn't just because of her writing mentorship. It was also because she was someone who was kind of very much of the opinion, if it wasn't there, she kind of set it up and created it. If she felt there was a particular kind of poetry event not happening, she would do it. Or if she felt, you know, and, and it was that attitude I took on and that applied to as much the writing as it did to everything else I did. Thank you. Emma, I wonder, you obviously um, were involved in mentoring Catalina to some extent, but I wonder in your role as an agent, is mentoring authors an important part of that job? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, it, it's an interesting one. It, it sort of depends a little bit on um, at, at what stage of their career the relationship begins. Um, certainly, most of most of the authors that I represent, um, I've sort of been there more or less from from the very beginning. Um, and um, in the case of some nonfiction writers, you know, um, I, I've written. To them to suggest writing books so you know really really from the, the very beginning in some respects um and and i think that does i mean i think one of the first things actually that it requires is is a, a kind of fairly straightforward unpacking of um of the industry um of of what what things mean um of what the process, different processes are. I, I think those things are, are, are often assumed and actually um, writers who, who are new to 
to, to professionalizing their, their relationship with, with other people in the industry as a writer um, are, are really kind of closed off from, from a lot of that, a lot of that knowledge. Um, um, whether you would categorize that as, as, as mentorship, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that does inform, inform the relationship. But then of course, I, I also work with, I start working with some writers who are, you know, several books in or, or a few books into their, into their writing career um, or their career as a published writer. So, so the relationship there will be slightly dif different, but I mean, I think the thing about agenting actually is that um, there is no one, well, there's no one way to be an agent actually, but then there's also no one way for one person to, to be even to be an, an agent because because each relationship, each individual relationship is, is very, very different. And you, you have to sort of um, understand uh, an individual's needs and, and, um, and intentions and, and, and how, they, how they are in the world and how they want their books to be in, in the world in order to kind of create a relationship that, that suits them. Mm. You talk about um, helping some writers to professionalise their relationships. You mean with figures within the publishing world and within the book world, or you mean with their readers, in effect? To, to oh, no, I just think that there's a way when you're, when you're, there's a difference, isn't there, for, for most people between um, writing for writing alone in your, in your room and, um, Perhaps sitting and writing a novel, and then and then entering, and, and then taking your manuscript and sort of entering an, an industry. That they're, they're, they're two very different modes, I guess. And and my goal um, at that stage is to sort of prepare them for that and, and equip them with the with the knowledge that that will help them nav navigate that that a world in which there's a set of kind of codes and. Um, uh, you know pieces of language that are used that that you know even even the word sort of submission I think is not is not in in any way transparent to to someone who who hasn't read about how to do that or what that what that involves so it's things like that. Thank you. Um, three of you are writers and you have day jobs connected with writing connected with literature, and I suppose it's there's always. For writers other than you know, the handful who um, don't need day, day jobs, uh, there's always the question of whether to get a job in the world of books or whether to get a job completely unconnected with it. And you've obviously all made the decision to do the former. And I suppose a question for the three of you is, well, it's a two-pronged question. Do you feel that that has had a positive effect on your writing? And do you feel it's had a positive effect on your career as a writer as separate from your career as a teacher or a publisher um start with Catalina please yeah um so the, the question sort of how has it affected you on a craft yeah. side and then on the sort of business side almost. professional side yeah 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 I think for, for me for both um it's definitely been a positive I think um I have a lot of um empathy for authors when they come through uh, kind of the, the funding process um, in my role as literature officer um, because I kind of appreciate the that everyone has a different process but I appreciate what what goes into making a book happen um, and that a, a lot of it is research and just letting things percolate um, so I think it gives me a lot of insight into that um, and I think you need to give people a lot of grace when they're coming to you asking for help with their projects because it's a very emotive thing to, um, you know, some of these authors, it's the first time they've ever spoken to anybody about this project and they don't necessarily have the confidence in their own work yet, but there's a spark of something there and being able to kind of help that along is just such a privilege. Um, and I think obviously kind of having connections with other authors, you know, nobody works in a vacuum. Um, I think it's really important to read, to share ideas, to kind of collaborate. And so I feel, yeah, it's a real honor to be able to do that with all my various hats on 
Um, it's the same with my work with Corio. I'm working with authors to adapt their work for audio. Um, and that's a very collaborative process. And I think all of that feeds into my own work. I'm, I'm, always, um, I'm always looking at other people's work and kind of thinking about how we all sit in this industry. Um, and then from a kind of professional side, obviously it's a very much an industry built on people and relationships and relationship building. And I think that um, we have such great supportive communities. Um, if you find the right people who, who can kind of um, help you better yourself and better the community around you, I think that's a really great thing. And I think that, yeah, for me being kind of all books all the time has been helpful in a kind of 360 way. Thank you. Martin, how has uh, been being all books all the time been for you? Um, I think uh, it's a really good question. I think on, I think it used to really be quite difficult, um, but now it feels less so. I think for me, my, one of my natural responses to reading poetry, and I, I remember it's really clearly kind of sort of encountering particular poems at particular moments, and then and then I was kind of moved to write. And it really is that simple. So I'm moved, to, and working in a poetry library, I'm constantly moved to write because I'm constantly having that interaction, so I just have to write. Uh, career aside, it's just how I think about poetry, and I think I'll just always continue to, to do so. Um, so in terms of kind of my own writing and, and I don't know if it's improved it or not, but it's just a kind of natural way of me doing what I do, because that's how I think about poetry. Um, but I, um, what Catalina was saying also made me think of, sort of to come back to this mentorship idea, is also the kind of co-mentorship, which kind of naturally happens between people, which I think has been really the key thing um, uh, for me as well. It's kind of in, is those interactions and those have often been around writing they've been social things they've been writing groups i've gone to they've been reading groups i've gone to they've been the workshops during lockdown which have kind of and and those are kind of also the times where i'm sort of really i don't know compress it sort of breaking down things that are happening at work also happen then in those situations only they don't feel there's no agenda so they kind of happen incidentally that's when we kind of talk about I don't know what's going on in the poetry world and things like that we'll have a chat about and those are really really important those kind of casual things and so the link between the writing and then the, the day job is is like I said before about this idea of it being a literary ecology rather than literary, literary sector it's kind of organic. Thank you, thank you very much. Sinead, um, do you feel that teaching creative writing has helped you to grow as a writer? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. I feel I've learned more than I've ever imparted, actually. Um, and just to just to echo what both Martin and Catalina have said, it's kind of hard to draw a boundary between, you know, the craft or the career because it, it's so interconnected. And there's something really exciting um, as a teacher of creative writing, just being in a room with people who are equally as passionate as you are about line endings or you know metaphors or whatever it is that you happen to be talking about and it's not just the students as well you know you're working with other brilliant writers you're working with the staff in the department and you know you, you find yourself again to to use the word relationships and ecology but you find yourself part of a kind of really enriching space where you can have conversations about about your work and about other people's work and also you know, the whole kind of wider um, ecology, you know, of events and workshops and festivals and all these things that, you know, universities are, are plugged into, not just universities, you know, lots of other external organizations kind of plug into these things and, and, and share the space. And all of that is really inspiring. I completely agree with Martin. I write a poem when I am exposed to other brilliant poetry. So, yeah, I don't really see a division. And yes, absolutely, books all the time is, is has been, um, yeah, has been everything for me, really. Thank you very much, Sinead. Um, I would love to keep asking you questions, but we have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, the first of which, when it says authors, what was it about your, <coughs> sorry, what was it about your cover letter that struck a chord with your agent? Um, but I think perhaps we'll turn that over to the agent on the panel 
first of all, to say, what, what in a cover letter do you, do you, what strikes a chord with you? So I always ask people, or I always um, uh, advise people who, um, who are kind of putting together their first cover letter to identify their, um, well, e either their influences, um, their writing influences, or and or um, writers that they feel their work is somehow in, in conversation with. Um, a, it's incredibly interesting, and B, it's really, really helpful because if I read something, if I read a manuscript and I really respond to it, um, it's it's quite important for me then to know that the writer and I are thinking about the work in 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 a similar way or um, have have an understanding about the con have a, a shared understanding about the context of of their work. Um, so yeah, so that, that that's one thing I really like to see. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, the next question from Rebecca Miles is: Any advice on choosing an MA? I too am a teacher. But interested in a creative writing MA, probably online and part time post work. I don't know how to begin choosing one. Um, Martin, do you have any advice? How did you select Manchester Metropolitan? Um, it was definitely the, I was looking at who was teaching um, at the time. I remember it quite clearly, and it was people whose work I was passionate about or I, you know, who inspired me to write in the first place. And it, it was really kind of as simple as that. And then, and then I looked into it and, and, and and it was also getting feedback from other people who'd done the course and, and just meeting them and, and, and finding out more. And I think those are the two things, really. Thank you very much. Um, Sinead, would you agree with that? Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I just agree with both points Martin's made. Yeah, I would, uh, I would go to the course where the people whose work you admire are teaching, um, people you, you want to find out more from. So do the research, read the work of the staff, talk to alumni, absolutely. Um, obviously, courses will, you know, will, they will differ to a certain extent in terms of what's being taught, and you can consider that, but I think most MAs kind of do teach the same kinds of things. You know, there's going to be workshops, there's going to be chances to be within a genre or outside a genre, there's going to be opportunities to do all kinds of kind of community projects and outreach work that Martin, you know, took such brilliant advantage of um, during his time at university. So, so yeah, see, see what's around the course as well as what, what is on the course. Um, but yeah, who's teaching it and what do um, former students say? Thank you. Um, Catalina, can I just come to you because you did an MA in publishing. You did creative writing as an undergraduate in a very unconventional way around and then uh, an MA in publishing. Um, how valuable do you think an MA in publishing is and would your advice, what would your advice be for choosing an MA in publishing? Yeah, so, um, so it was actually a Masters of Science and I think that um, some, some can be Masters of Arts and some can be Masters of Science and I think it really depends what you are what your intention is um, I think with something that's quite vocational like a publishing master's um, it's a lot more focused on like professional development than a kind of creative craft so um, because I already had experience in the industry I was looking to kind of fill the gaps of areas that I didn't know very much about like rights and production for example um, and I think that's obviously been very helpful in my role now that is more wide sector development um, because I think one thing I found a bit frustrating sometimes about my role is that um, publishing, even though it's a very collaborative industry, can sometimes feel siloed. And I think it's really important to obviously be good at the specific job that you do, but to understand um, the importance and the kind of specificity of what other people you collaborate with do also. So I think um, I think for me, it was important to kind of gain a practical skill set, um, you know, things like understanding. Photoshop, for example, uh, is really important if you want to go into design. So I think that um, look very closely at what you're going to get out of that experience and be very clear with your intention of what you want to do. But that being said, I think if you don't know very much about publishing, which is completely fair, a lot of people go into a master's in publishing without industry experience and you absolutely 
that's not a prerequisite at all. But I think that a lot of people go in um, perhaps assuming that they want to go into a specific area. Usually it's editorial because that's quite a visible area. But I think be open minded because you might surprise yourself. Like I didn't necessarily think I wanted to go into audio and digital until I was in it. So um, I think keep open minded because there are a lot of roles that you might not necessarily know about yet. Thank you. Um, Emma, do you, well, two questions really. The first is how many, um, what, what sort of proportion of your authors are graduates of creative writing programs these days? <coughs> and secondly, what proportion of, you know, new hires at Aitken Alexander are graduates of publishing master's degrees? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so taking the second question first, I think, I think zero. Um, uh, I think, um, and the first question is a good one. I don't know if I have a, a completely accurate answer, but I, I would imagine I represent around 70 authors and I would imagine maybe 10 of, 10 of them. Oh, really? Yeah, maybe 10. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Shirley Skeel asks, is it essential to have a well-followed social media presence if you want to be a published literary fiction writer? Um, Emma, what are your thoughts on that? No. <laughs> right. um, I mean, uh, I, I think if you enjoy it and, um, and you're already there, um, there are some benefits, you know. Um, I think actually one of, one of the, the real benefits is maybe feeling connected to other writers and, and, and I know that people have built communities um, that way, small communities that way and, and, and felt supported by the people in those communities. Um, I, don't, I don't know that getting on there as a, to increase publicity is necessary. It's, I don't find that to be essential um, at all. And, uh, and, I, and the, there was a time when publishers, I think, um, were encouraging authors to do that and, and did believe it to be essential, but that's now changed, I, I, I think. Um, there's no need, if it, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, um, and certainly Twitter can be quite an uncomfortable space, I would avoid it and just keep writing. I'd say I'm not on Twitter because it makes me feel uncomfortable, but during the lockdowns, I was sort of stalking it quite a lot, and everyone <laughs> seemed to be having such a good time chatting to each other. Uh, Catalina, are you on social media, and is it is it valuable in career terms? I am on social media, and I have uh, a complex relationship with it. What I would advise is um, is finding the spaces that bring you joy and community, because I think that. Um, the infinite scroll is where the downfall is and I think it's very easy to to kind of fall down a rabbit hole and and I, I think it's important to kind of know what you think about something and not um and not indulge in comparanoia which I think social media can be particularly um fraught with especially if you're in the creative field it's very easy to look at other people who are your peers or who are maybe um kind of a step ahead of you in your career where you want to be and be like oh everything's going so right for them but obviously it's a much more complex picture than that and I think it's it's obviously a great space to celebrate your wins and other people's wins and that is where it can be really joyful but I think that finding those pockets um, of spaces where you feel like you find your people that you really connect with um, like there are some really lovely like writers chats that happen on a regular basis and obviously that you can meet writers internationally and find critique partners and um, friends and readers and your your kind of craft will develop together but I think be be kind of cautious with how you spend your time and energy because um, as we all know that's the that's where you, you have to refill your creative well and I think that it can be a bit of a like time and energy suck if you're not careful so curate your space. Thank you. Martin, what are your thoughts on social media? Uh, I'm not on social media, but I'm glad the library is. Like for Manchester Poetry Library, it's really, really important because it's it's not, um, in fact, much less to, well, it is an important way for us to communicate with people and tell them what's on. But it's also, I think people sort of um, forget it's kind of Twitter, in particular, its potential as a kind of listening tool. Um, uh, that it kind of if you're if you're running an organization that's where a lot of people just get in touch with us and and 
it, and sort of directly and just to see what's going on we can put questions out there to see what people want and, and have those kind of conversations so i think um yeah i'm really glad um i'm really glad that the, that the pro chillar is on on twitter and that it's there for it and and i also i'm starting to enjoy the differences between instagram and twitter and just uh, just kind of and and i think uh, yeah that that kind of having fun with it is is key i think um that's really that's been really important as well Thank you. Sinead, I think you said earlier that you're not on social media, but have you ever been tempted? No, I've never been tempted. <laughs> <laughs> I find it really, really, really frightening. And um, I think that the kind of the simplification and the polarization tendencies of it, um, I think the rage, I think all of that is really inimical and I don't really want anything to do with it. But I, you know, having said that's my position, but... Um, you know, it's really nice to hear such a nuanced, two really nuanced answers there from Catalina and Martin, you know, that, you know, you can find um, pools of positivity within that. But in general, no, I, I really don't like it. And I, it was quite a relief to hear Emma say that, you know, there's a turn away from that kind of insistence from agents and publishers now. Um, there's a question here, which is what what would you say are the most important things a writer should look for in an agent? Emma, I think we'll put that to you, first of all. Um, well, it does sort of depend on what you're writing, but um, broadly speaking, um, I think it's really important to sit down, well, if it's possible to sit down with, with the person, but if not, to, to talk to them. Um, and ask and ask an agent what they think of your work or what they you know what they think of the piece of work that you've shared or submitted um, and to it, I guess to clarify through that conversation whether your sort of creative um, goals for it are aligned um, and I think alignment is not the same as um, agreement necessarily um but if if nothing product if the, if nothing productive is coming out of that editorial conversation um then possibly you're not the right fit um so i would i would start with that um i would start with uh, i think strong communication i think most of the difficulties in in an agent writer relationship um occur when when communication has broken down um so i think you certainly want to look for an agent who will respond to you who are not sort of you know worried about bothering um i know some people maybe sometimes feel quite intimidated by by writing to their agents or checking things but um it's important that you feel able to talk to your agent um i think those are the two to, yeah, to, for it to be quite kind of text, the relationship to be quite kind of text-based and, and good on communication. Thank you. Um, Sinead, poets often don't have agents, so maybe the question is more about the, your relationship with an editor, but would, would you agree what are the most important things to look for in a relationship with either an editor or an agent? As someone who'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Um, and someone, yeah, someone who will tell you the truth, but someone who's also on your side, right? So I think that would sum it up, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Catalina, is that what you look for? Yeah, honestly, I think Sinead completely summarised it there. Someone who's an advocate, but who also will be very honest with you and who shares your vision for each project, but also your career kind of as a whole. Um, the next question is for you as well, Catalina. It's from Kate Wilkins, and it's what does a day at work look like for Catalina? That is a very good question, um, and I'm sure the other panelists will agree that there, there is no typical day um, in our roles. Um, for me, so I work with a very uh, a small kind of literature team at Creative Scotland, but we also collaborate with other art forms. Um, so. Um, that's really great to kind of get their their view on how their industry works um so 
typically I will be either speaking with um, potential applicants either on the phone or on a video call or by email answering their questions um, about kind of eligibility or specifics about their project so we encourage people to come and chat to us if they're like I have an idea for a thing is it is there some funding that I could apply for from you because we have various different funds we have one that's kind of year round but then we have other things that roll kind of throughout the year so we try and almost match make between projects and funding um, and we chat through you know what our criteria is what our guidance is just to make sure that the whole process is as transparent as it can be because i know it can be quite intimidating to put in a funding application it kind of feels like you fill it in and then it just goes off into the ether but no it goes to real human beings um, who look at it and we have a set of criteria that we judge it against um, and then it can be assessing applications that come in sitting on panels for various funds with other kind of art form specialists and discussing those applications and um, deciding if something will be funded, if it's recommended or if it's not recommended. And that can be quite difficult because obviously there are a lot of projects that we just, we don't have infinite money, unfortunately. So we do have to make some quite tough decisions. Um, and so the fallout of that can be having difficult follow-up conversations with individuals or organizations who haven't been recommended this time and advising them on, um, specific weaknesses in the application or ways that they can improve their project if they want to come in to reapply. Um, I also have regular check-ins with organizations that we fund kind of year round. So there's those things and then looking at um, specific targeted funds. So there are projects that we're also doing kind of in-house that we're working on. So it's a lot of talking to people um, all day and sort of jumping from one thing to another and it's quite reactive. Um, but I think that's very enjoyable because it means every day looks a little bit different. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, uh, Michelle says, I would love to set up a poetry library at my university. Do you do events, spoken word evenings, writing slash poetry workshops? Um, yeah, we do. We do all of them. And, and I think, yeah, the more poetry libraries, the better. Um, there's there's quite a few. Um, we are uh, this is it, there's kind of quite a high poetry library density happening, um, but I still think the more the more the better really. Um, yeah, we do all of those. Although we opened in September, um, uh, we the program is slowly developing, um, uh, but we've just had two new appointments: a learning manager and a learning officer, and who are going to be uh, looking at kind of adding to the program we're already doing. So um, this is, again, is part of the the kind of the, what I enjoy about the job is the huge variety of things, um, which include everything from, yeah, spoken word nights and, and, and book groups to uh, a poetry record club, which should be happening soon. And it's kind of the fact that those things are actually part of my, my job, but sometimes I can't you know it does seem quite unreal sometimes that I'm when I'm organizing it I've got to be I'm organizing a poetry record club and this is actually part of my job which is brilliant thank you very much um there's a question here which is how do we find publishing internships opportunities how should we prepare for applying now I'd, I'd like to ask um certainly Emma Martin and Catalina what's the situation with internships in your particular line of work I mean are they still a very big thing. I know there was a big fuss a few years ago about the number of unpaid. I mean, when I left university, I went and did a number of internships and very few of them paid anything. And it was a totally exploitative situation. Is that still the case, Emma? Um, so we don't offer an internship. Um, the internships that I am aware of are now paid. Um, I mean, Catalina might be a little bit closer to some of this than um but um I, I i agree with you edmund i don't i i think i think if um an unpaid internship is advertised um actually on on twitter for example i think um people are very kind of you know it, it, it's criticized um I, I i think it's hard it's hard to do that now um but um, I might I might be wrong. There may, may be some opportunities, or not opportunities, but there still may be some internships being advertised that are not paid. But I think they're much more formalised now. Formalised as in they are paid positions. Catalina, is that is that your experience? 
think so. I think um, I think there are still I think because I think it's if something's work experience where it's for a specific a very short specific time, um, and I think is I do think that generally everyone should get paid for their time, but I understand that there are some exchanges um, where either there, there aren't funds available, but I would strongly suggest that if an organization can pay people for their time, they should. However, that being said, I do think sometimes it's perfectly acceptable to accept an unpaid opportunity if you feel like you're getting something fair, there's like a fair exchange in return for your time and labor. And I think maybe looking at it more like an apprenticeship model where you're, um, you're like shadowing someone and you're kind of learning the ropes while you um, are in situ is maybe a good way of looking at it. But I think if you're being given responsibility, if you're working quite autonomously, that should probably be, pay be a paid internship. And, um, and I, I think that the industry in general is getting a lot better at trying to remunerate people for their time, which is great. Mm. Martin, in, in any of the jobs that you've done, have internships been a necessary stepping stone to gaining employment? Mm, no, not directly. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm, try, I'm trying to think now, but, I would, but it has to be said that I was really lucky, for instance, to have funding for my PhD um i couldn't have done it without that which isn't exactly an internship but is another kind of barrier where where it's like, you know you don't always get that and that kind of would suddenly i don't know yeah that would probably ruled out everything in my career after that so um or maybe maybe not i don't know but um being this is where kind of being part of a larger organization like a university is kind of um um the university does offer student internships which are paid and, and we've kind of tried to um yeah make opportunities available um as much as possible um and it's it's really great for us because i think the the the, the students and the interns bring so much to what we do and we try to give them as much freedom as possible to kind of explore their own interests within the kind of day-to-day -day running of the poetry library and as i said we're lucky to be able to do that because there's so many different things you could be doing and, and kind of get involved with um, so that space is there. Thank you very much. Um, we may just have time for one more question. Um, I, so this question, I'm going to preface with another question. Well, the question is, um, would you say that pursuing a career in literature has tarnished or lessened your love of it in any way? And I'd like to just preface that by asking a question of my own, a sort of writer question, which is how much reading do you have to do in your jobs? And I want, you know, hard figures, like how many pages you having to read per week. Um, Sinead. Well, I have to read poems and they're really short. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do a lot less reading than people who teach prose and are reading, you know, big extracts from novels. Um, yeah, so I don't find the reading at all kind of overwhelming. Martin's kind of a drag. I think everybody who does it would agree with that. It's a bit like having your head in a vice when you've got all these scripts to do and you've got to do the feedback and everything. But yeah, I don't find it onerous and uh, it hasn't tarnished or lessened my love of literature. Really, it's just increased it. Thank you. Emma, how much do you have to read and has, you know, maybe tarnished it is, is too sort of leading a question, but has it changed your relationship to literature? working in the literary world? Um, so it's hard to say. I think there are, I think there are periods when it, it's particularly intense, actually coming back from Christmas, uh, there's, there's a huge amount of reading. So and maybe reading uh, or, or attempting to read two manuscripts or partial manuscripts uh, a week at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, or, or getting back to people on in progress material. Um, I don't think it has changed my relationship. Uh, well, it probably has subtly changed my relationship to literature, but I think what, what I found to be uh, increasingly important for me is to, um, to ensure that I have access to, or, or I'm participating in, in other creative, forms um, alongside uh, alongside all of the reading that I'm doing um, and, to, and and actually to ensure that I'm reading books that have um, very little to do with me 
my work in a, in the day to day sense. So I'm you know making sure I have time to read something that uh, was published hundred years ago, for example. Um, I think that's as important as as reading something published this week and um, and and making sure that I do go to the cinema or I, or I can go to galleries because I think it, it all sort of feeds into the work that I'm, I'm doing anyway. Um, so yeah, perhaps that's the way it's changed. I'm sort of consciously carving out space and time to, 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 to do that. Thank you. Uh, Martin. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm thinking of that word tarnished and I'm wondering where that's come from. And I'm thinking back about my own kind of history. <laughs> and I'd say that um, um, I think I understand that question because I did my English degree and there that question felt really important to me. And I did sort of feel like doing this thing I loved full time. It, it was a huge shock doing that English degree and thinking about literature so diff differently. And it kind of put me off it for a bit. Um, I didn't do my MA. There's a big gap between my, my first degrees um, where I did a lot of things. A lot of it was avoiding literature. Um, and I guess I didn't really speak about that until I kind of, until I had this encounter with poetry. And this was poetry I hadn't done during my undergraduate degree. It was kind of felt new to me and, and, and fresh and it, it did something. And I felt like I was meeting on my own terms. So when I started doing the MA and things like that, I felt like it was it felt more like I was encountering literature back on my own terms than when I was doing my degree, if I'm going to be honest. Um, now, though, um, it gets a bit messy and I do read a lot. I don't know how much I read. It is it is poetry I'm reading here and there and I probably read much more than I think. Um, but I did start keeping a reading diary because I felt really so sort of self-conscious and thinking it felt like I wasn't reading anything at all. Um, so I started making a note of the things I was reading and just keeping a kind of journal of what I read and then actually that allowed me to look back over the year and kind of looking what is my sort of what's my diet of books like um, and allowed me to kind of think actually you know to sort of reflect on that and who I was what kind of reader I was um, so um, that's what I'm doing but I'm a really slow reader I'm an unapologetically slow reader reader audiobooks have been a revelation for me because they've allowed me to tackle all the long texts I couldn't because I always fell asleep and that's kind of why I like poetry as well is because it's short um, but now I love long text especially on in audio. Well you have Catalina to thank for that. Catalina um, has your relationship with books with reading changed and how much reading do you have to do in an average if there is such thing as an average week? Um, yeah I'll answer the second question first. Um, it's a little more difficult to quantify the amount of reading because it's it tends to be applications or writing samples, um, but they can run quite long, um, which is great because we we have sort of a like minimum word count. But but when you get people talking about things that they're passionate about, they 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 are um, very effusive, which is great. Um, and when you sit on panel, you might have thirty or more applications to read through. Um, so that, that can be quite a lot of pages. Um, yeah, um, and to your first question about how has my relationship with literature changed? Um, I feel like, it, I feel like it's, it's deepened. Um, and with that, there's kind of like a, a, a bittersweetness to it where I, I have such a, an appreciation for, um, for everything that goes into creating a book. Um, from all sides, um, from all inputs, um, and for readers and for everyone who gets those books into readers' hands. Um, I think that kind of what we were saying about in, a, in an academic setting, um, something that really blew my mind when I was an undergraduate was when I did my year abroad because um, I was studying texts, but um, not just books. I was, we were kind of looking at TV shows in conversation with books and films in conversation with plays and um, realizing that everything is quite intertextual. And obviously now with my job, I'm the literature officer, but we, we also speak to dance and theater and, um, and all different kinds of art forms. And I think what Emma was saying about um, consuming different forms of media, I think is, is really important because um, it, it, it is all in dialogue with each other. So it's, it's definitely a more complicated relationship, but I think it's a very, a very, very deep love, but a love um, where you, you see all of the, the highlights and the flaws. Thank you. I think that's um, a terrific place to end with everybody's 
enduring love of literature. I would love to go on listening to you all. And uh, there are so many more great questions that we haven't had time to get around to. I'm sorry if we didn't make it to your question. Um, but please, uh, you know, join me in thanking, um, first of all, Beth Gallimore at the RSL and James Grand at King's for organising this event. And especially in thanking um, our absolutely wonderful panellists. It's been great. Thank you all so much.